Amen and amen. Worthy is the Lamb. If you have your Bibles, would you please open them to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is where we are this morning. We're coming back to our series of messages on prevailing prayer. Jesus, in verse 9 of Matthew 6, he says, Pray then in this way. He's not given us a standard to pray by, and he's not given us a prayer to memorize and recite, though there's nothing wrong with that if it's, if it's from the heart. He, he is giving us a model prayer. Um, by which we should pray. He's laying down principles of prayer, prevailing prayer, victorious prayer, conquering prayer, prayer that has power. There are principles in the scripture laid forth by our Lord that honestly I believe when followed, properly appropriated, carried out, will usher in a power and a presence in your life that otherwise just isn't going to happen. And listen, I'm not just simply preaching something I read out of a book somewhere. These principles that we've been going over and will go over for the next three or four weeks are, are principles that, that, that I've applied to my life every day for the last 30 years. And so I can tell you from the Word of God most of all, but also from personal testimony. that when we learn, appropriate, and put into practice the principles that are laid forth in this scripture, then not only do we have a prayer life that prevails, we have a life itself that prevails. God's word is absolute truth, and you can trust him to do what he says. He'll do he will do if, you'll, if you will do it His way. Powerful, prevailing, victorious life is yours. And it's for every believer when we rightly divide and apply the Word of God to our life. And, and understand this, guys. God, God desires to bless you. I hope you understand that. I hope you believe that look at your neighbor and say god wants to bless you but you got to put yourself in a place to get blessed go ahead tell them that too god longs to bless us listen to uh philippians 4 19 20 says and my god shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so God, God will supply our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. It's a promise from God that you can believe, you can hold to, you can claim it. But Paul says it's to the glory of the Father. You see, there's, there's a blessing, there's a, there's a supply, there's a need that's yours. But, it's, but the way of appropriation of that need, of that blessing, is through the glory of the Father. If we follow the principles laid out, if we appropriate them and practice them, we can see God do amazing things. And so we come to the fifth message in this series on prevailing prayer. We've talked about prayer in the secret place, prayer and praying with serenity. We've talked about praying for the kingdom, praying concerning the holiness of God and praying for the will of God to be accomplished in our lives. And today we come to this message, prevailing prayer and our needs. We all have needs at different times and in different ways. You have needs. Tammy and I, we have needs. This church has needs. And everything we need our good, good Father has. Everything we need, 
He doesn't just have it to meet the need, but to meet the need in abundance. And so I want to take a few minutes this morning to talk about prevailing prayer and its priority, and then prevailing prayer and its provision. So the first point, prevailing prayer and its priority, it, it, it takes us back. If we're going to see God meet our needs and meet them abundantly, then we need to see and practice the priority that Jesus puts before us. And so we look at verse 9, and he says, Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And our focus is verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Father, meet our daily need. And so between the end of verse 10 and the beginning of verse 11, you can draw a line right there because the prayer changes. In the first half of the prayer, it's a focus on God. It's a focus on the things of God. And the second part of the prayer is about our needs. It's about our forgiveness. It's about our deliverance. And, um, but until we tend to the things of God first, then we can't rightly believe, hope, expect God to answer as it concerns our needs and our forgiveness and our deliverance. Prevailing prayer. Number one, proclaim the holy name of God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Number two, promote the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come. Number three, pursue the will of God. Thy will be done in heaven and on earth. Our God is a holy God. Everything about him is holy. Holiness is the very essence of who he is and his love and his grace and his mercy and his goodness and his kindness and even his judgment and his wrath and his discipline and his chastisement. It all flows through the holiness of God. He is thrice holy according to the scriptures. It means to be set apart. He is holy, majestic, glorious, and worthy of our undivided worship. And so the first thing we ought to do when we go to the Lord in prayer, and I hope you do, but the first thing we ought to do is worship His holy name. Now, I believe oftentimes we go to prayer and we say, Father, I need this, I need this, I need this, and I need this. When we should have started with, Father, how great you are. God, how great you are. Father, I praise you for your provision and your protection. I praise you, O oh God, for so great a salvation. I praise you because from the foundations of the earth, you chose me to be your child. I praise you because through Christ Jesus, your Son and my Lord, I set securely in the palm of your hand. I praise you because I am indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God, and day by day you infill me with power from on high. Father, I praise you for your holy word because I know it's absolute truth and I can trust you at your word. The first thing we ought to do in prayer is to worship a holy God. And then we need to promote and seek his kingdom. We should pray as he does here, your kingdom come. Or with John in Revelation chapter 22, come now, Lord Jesus, even now. I wonder how many of us pray for the coming of the Lord. How many of us pray that the kingdom of God would return? Pray for the kingdom of God to come. Are you ready? I mean, if God showed up today, if, if, if the trumpet sounded and there was a shout, are you ready to meet Jesus today? I'm not talking to the unbeliever, though it applies. I'm talking to the believer. Do you get excited when you think about seeing Jesus face to face? What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Come now, Lord Jesus, 
come even now. Now, amen, sister. Now, I'm not, I'm not ready to get on the next bus, but I'm ready to go. I'm ready whenever he is ready. And so I pray thy kingdom come. But I don't just pray his kingdom come in its, in, in, in manifest itself, that the kingdom come and we go to be with him. I'm also praying that the kingdom of God be manifest in my life every day. You get that? Look at your neighbor and say, you're a kingdom child. And you ought to be promoting the kingdom. Wherever you go, whatever you do, wherever God has sovereignly placed you in this world, wherever he's placed you in Bartow County, whatever job you have, whatever family you belong to, your calling is to promote the kingdom of God. That's the preacher's job. Pastor, no, it's not. It's the Christian's job. And we ought to pray about it. And then we ought to pray, thy will be done. What is the will of God? It's very simple. Exalt Christ. Exalt Christ, evangelize the lost, and, and equip and encourage the saints. That's the will of God. It's you and I taking the spiritual gifts that the, that the Holy Spirit has given us, and together as a fellowship, we use those spiritual gifts to carry out the will, the purpose, and the plan of God. And we ought to be playing, praying over those things before we ever pray that our daily need be met. Now, I'm talking about prevailing in prayer and and our provision, our daily needs being met. And here's the thing, if, if you're going to prevail, if you're going to be victorious in your daily provision, you can't start with your daily provision. Well, Pastor, that don't make sense. A lot of what God says don't. Not in the flesh. The first half of this prayer, the first principles that, that God lays down, the Lord himself gives us deal with the holiness and the kingdom and the will of God in our life. We have to put first things first. As a pastor, I hear things like, well, I prayed, but God just didn't answer. You know, pastor, I, I, I have prayed, I have prayed over our marriage and God just, God just didn't come through. Pastor, I'm praying that my children be delivered from alcohol or addiction or a bad relationship or whatever it is, and I just don't see God move. But listen, in, in love, don't tell me those things if you're not making the things of God a priority in your life. He, he's not, he, he's not some, some government agency in the sky handing out everything to everybody that wants something. He's a holy God. And if you want to see him open up his hands and pour out his blessings on you, then you need to seek him as a holy God. As a pastor, you hear those things, but, but, but listen. I want you to listen to my heart now. Listen. If you're listening, say, I'm listening, pastor. Why? Why should God? He's promised. But why should God give us his supply in abundance if we're not really going to seek his holiness and his kingdom and his will in our prayer lives and in our everyday life? You've heard that saying, you've got your priorities out of order. Nothing rings truer than it does right here in prevailing prayer and the principles that are laid forth by Jesus. So let me ask you a few questions. Does God have first place in your life? You say yes. Let me ask you a few more questions. Does God get the first and the best of your time, your talents, and your treasures. Do you spend time with God in prayer and in His Word daily? See, this woman is the love of my life. I love her with everything I have. She is my queen. 
And there is not a day on this planet that I don't talk to her. Even if I'm in Romania or, or somewhere in the country or on some kind of mission trip or wherever I am, we're going to talk. And if I can get my hands on her, I'm going to hug her. And I'm going to kiss her. And I'm going to tell her I love her. The only one that sits in a higher place than her is the Lord Jesus. If you love somebody, you spend time with them. If you love somebody, you talk to them. If you love somebody, you'll give everything you've got to that person you love. You will, you will lay down your life for the love of your life. Do you spend time with God in prayer and His Word daily? Do you give God the first fruits of your finances? An honest to goodness tithe, not a tip. Is God the love of your life? Do you really love Him with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength? Do you seek out His kingdom for your life? Do you really seek to accomplish His will in and through your life? See, God, God's promise, if, if you will make God the priority of your life, He'll make His abundant blessing upon you His priority. Now listen, 1 Samuel 20, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 2 and verse 20, He says, I will honor Him that honors me. Matthew 6 and verse 33, we'll look at again in a moment, but seek ye the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things, all these needs will be added unto you. And listen, um, I, I just want you to hear this scripture. I love Psalm 37. And I love it. And I just want you to hear those first seven verses. He says, do not fret, do not worry. Don't concern yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they'll wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Now, now listen, he says, trust. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That goes beyond your needs. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do it. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Don't fret because of Him who prospers in His way. See, there, it's a glorious promise that God would give us the very desires of our heart. And all we've got to do is cultivate faithfulness, delight ourselves in Him, commit our ways to Him, trust Him, and rest in Him. And He'll do it. We, we often want to see the desires of our hearts fulfilled, and we long to see the needs of life fulfilled, but we haven't completely given everything over to Him, and we haven't made Him a priority in our life. Prevailing prayer and its priority. But then, let's look at this. Prevailing prayer and His provision give us this day our daily bread. Now, now look, Jesus says daily bread, and He's talking about, uh, about our need. We, we don't... He's teaching us not to worry about tomorrow's bread. What happens when we worry about tomorrow's bread? I'll tell you what happens. You don't enjoy today's bread. And God's given you sufficiency for the day. I, I would say that not a single person sitting in this sanctuary today will go hungry. Most every one of us, if not all of us sitting here today, we will eat what we want, when we want, where we want, how we want. 
I wonder if we'll take the time to thank God for it. But some of us can't enjoy today's blessing, today's need, today's bread because we're so consumed about tomorrow. Guys, tomorrow may not even be yours. In Matthew 6, 25 through 33, through 33, Jesus tells us three things. And it has to do with meeting our daily needs. But the first thing he tells us, our worry is worthless. Worrying over tomorrow is worthless. Verse 25, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for the body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? By worthless, I mean our worry over tomorrow's bread has no worth. It has no worth whatsoever. We're not even promised tomorrow. If you have a need, daily bread, pray for it. Trust God to provide it. And rejoice. And enjoy it. God has already promised that if we ask believing, He would do it. And that's good to me. Didn't you know what Jesus Jesus said? Whatever you ask in my name, believing, I will do it that the Father might be glorified. If the very purpose in our obtaining, of our getting, uh, uh, whatever it is, if the very purpose behind it is the glory of the Father, He's already promised if you'll ask in the name of my Son, I'll take care of it. I would rather live. This, this is good. You write this down. I would rather live in the joy of the moment than worry over something that hasn't even happened yet. I would rather live in the joy of the moment than to worry over something that has not even happened. I'd rather praise God and give Him glory for His abundance than to cry out for more tomorrow. Worry robs us of our joy. It robs us of our peace. It robs us of our faith. It robs us of our trust. It robs us of our pleasure. And it robs us of our happiness. We can rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Our worry is worthless and then our worry is useless. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toll, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. You see that? God says you're worth more than the birds of the air. Look at your neighbor and say, do you even know how much you're worth in God's eyes? I, mean, I see, I see Christians that they walk around feeling so worthless. And listen, we're not we're not worth anything from God. But in Christ, you are. In Christ, you are special. I mean, he's quite literally saying here that you are worth more. You, you in Christ, my child. You are worth more than all of my creation. You're worth more than the birds of the air. You're worth more than the lilies of the field. And look at how I take care of them. And look at the beauty of the lilies of the field. How much more I'll do for you. God's promise. Our worry, our, our worry is worthless. Our worry is useless. And then our worry is faithless. Verse 30, he says, but... If, God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow and is thrown in the furnace. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry. Then say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? Listen, I'll just put it simply. Worry destroys your faith. Worry destroys your faith. When we worry over our need, we're in essence saying that 
I don't believe God will do what he says he will do. You know, it, it'd be like if I walked in to the house this afternoon and Tammy is sitting over in a corner all curled up and weeping and, and crying and, and I just say, honey, what's wrong, honey, what's wrong? And she says, she says, I, I'm worried. I, I'm worried about tomorrow. I'm worried about what we're going to eat tomorrow. I'm worried about how we're going to provide and I'm worried about our home and I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. She is in essence said, Ralph, I don't believe you can take care of me. And when we worry over the needs of tomorrow, and when we worry over the needs of this day, when we are consumed with worrying over these things, when we're consumed with all these things, we are in essence saying, God, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe you can take care of me. I don't believe you can provide for me. I don't believe you can protect me. God says you can. Trust in the Lord. Commit your way to him. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Worry destroys our faith. And then in verse 32, he says, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things for, uh, for your heavenly Father, from your heavenly Father, knows that you need all these things. You see, it's worthless, it's useless, it's faithless. And finally, when we worry, we act just like a bunch of pagans. We act just like a bunch of lost folk who have no hope. And yet we have hope in Christ. Folks, if, if, if God is able to save you and me in Christ, to save our souls to the uttermost and to keep us saved in Christ and carry us all the way to heaven, do you not think he can take care of our needs? Whatever they are? Yes, he can. And so he says, but seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's verse 33. So we've come full circle. We're back to the principles of prevailing prayer. Focus on his kingdom, his holiness, his will. And he'll focus on your needs and your forgiveness and your deliverance. Now think about something Brady Weldon said this week in Revival. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And, and I, like, I like what Brady said. You know, he said, our God is not enough. And then he paused. And I'm like, okay, where are you going? He said, our God is not enough. Our God is more, more than enough. Philippians 4, 19, 20 again. And, and my God will supply all your needs according to to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with the five loaves of bread and two fish, and he took up 12 baskets of leftovers. You started out with five fish and two loaves, and every disciple had a basket heaping over with leftovers to take with them. So your God's not enough. He's more than enough. That's scripture ascribes to him the name El Shaddai, God Almighty. And that's what it means. My God is more than enough. And so, when you're praying for your daily bread, you've prayed over the holiness of God, the kingdom of God, and the will of God, and now you've moved to your needs. And you're praying, give us this day our daily bread. And according to the word, we know that he's not enough. He's more than enough. So when you're praying for your daily bread, don't be surprised when a bread truck shows up at your house filled front to back, bottom to top with fresh baked bread. And so you got a choice to make. You can, you can, go, out, you can go out there and you can get your loaf for the day and then you can put all the rest of that bread in your cupboards and wherever else you want, and so you'll have so you'll have plenty moving forward. But what's going to happen? Yeah, in a day or two, that bread's going to be stale, and in a week or so, it's going to have mold growing on it. And you can go on and eat it if you want to. But when you prayed, "Give us this day our daily bread," so you didn't pray, "Give me 
You pray, give us. Us. Your prayer is not about you. It's about God. It's about his people. And then it's about you. And so when he shows up with that bread truck, you take your loaf. And then you get in that truck. And you go around and give away bread to everybody that needs it that day. And he gives you more than enough. It's so that you can be a blessing to the others around you. A concept that a lot of church just doesn't get today. Look what God gave me. Well, why in the world do you think God gave it to you? Not so you could just store it up and watch it rot. Give it away. As it concerns our needs. And, and listen, I, I'm not boasting. I'm not. I'm, and I, am, I am exalting Christ. I am glorifying God. But Tam, Tammy will say, her, one of her say, she said, she would say, well, we'd be rich if you'd quit giving it away. I understood. I began to study the concept of the, the, the command of tithing, the tithe and the offering. Years ago, we almost lost everything we had. Creditors were calling us and threatening us. We, we, we couldn't pay our bills on time. We were about to lose it all. This was two or three years into our marriage. And I stood outside one day beside the apartment. And I said, God, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And maybe the first time I ever really understood God was speaking to me, he said, have you tried tithing? I said, Father, I can't, afford, I can't afford to pay the bills I got. How am I going to tithe? Have you tried tithing? Trust me. Commit your way to me. Delight yourself in me. Rest in me and be patient. And I walked in, I told Tammy, I said, oh, the Lord just spoke. She said, what did he say? I said, he said, we got to start tithing. She said, we can't pay the bills. And I said, I know, honey. And I'm telling you, there were Sundays she would write out that check and she would say, I'm writing, I'm writing this by faith. I'm writing this by because when I write this check, there won't be any money to buy groceries. There won't be any money to pay this bill or that bill. And when we started, the day we started tithing, to this day, we have never been late on a bill. It's very obvious I've never missed a meal. God has provided wonderfully, folks. It just blows me away. And so for the last 30 years, I have sought to outgive God. And so I may never retire with a million dollar home. And I may never have all the stuff the world has. But I'll tell you what I got. I got a wife that loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all of her heart, mind, and soul this morning. I've got a daughter that walks with Jesus. And he blessed us by sending her a husband that loved the Lord and is now pastoring. And she's a pastor. I've seen God do this amazing thing. I have seen God put people in our lives that were there to bless us when we needed blessing. I've seen things taken care of in my life that were just, Jake, they were just miraculous. There's no other way to explain it. It, it just, God just showed up and provided. 30 years later, no. I don't, I, don't, I don't worry about my daily bread. I thank God for it. In fact, a lot of days when I'm praying, I will say, Father, give us this day our daily bread. But then I have to say, well, Father, I've got to thank you because my daily bread's already provided. Not, not just food on the table, but a roof over my head. And you, you, you've given me a place to live. And you, you've given me clothes to wear. And you've surrounded me 
with, with a wonderful, godly family that loves you with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you have surrounded me with friends that love that love us and have been a blessing to us. And Father, you have you put me in a church that loves me, that loves my wife, that we love. And I, man, I can go on and on and on. That song, count what it. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. There's not enough hours in the day to count my blessings. Yeah, and in November, the greatest, huh? In November, the greatest blessing thus far in our life. She'll be Nana, and I'll be Papa. And it all starts back here, where we decided to make God the priority of our life. His holiness, His kingdom, and His will. We made it a priority. And when we did, God made us a priority. Listen, folks, and I'm, and I'm done. I'm no better than anyone else. But anything God's ever done for me, he wants to do a hundred times more for you. But you have to do it his way. You have to do it his way. You can't do it your way. If I have a fear in my life, I, I, I am. And he says, do not fear. But if I have a fear, it's not that he won't provide. It's not that he won't protect. It's not that he won't supply. After all he's done for me, the fear of my life that somehow or some way I might disappoint him. That's what scares me. I'm not afraid of men. I'm not afraid of the devil. But I am afraid that I might touch his glory. I am afraid that I'll disappoint him. And this prevailing prayer, this victorious, conquering prayer, if you lay forth those principles in your life, you will. You will see God do the most amazing things in you and through you. You just have to decide that you're going to let him do it his way. Every head bowed and every eye closed.